Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Sundays with a cherry on top. I am your host, Cherry. I'm shining bright tonight. The skin's glowing out. I'm like, what is going on? I should have powdered before I came on. But anyway, listen, um, you know you know the drill. Find me on social media. We are live every Sunday. You can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter. And um, I just really want to say that we have New York. This is for the people in New York. We have a, a very important voting coming up, right? And so there's so many people who are putting their damn hat in the ring for to be mayor of the city. And just wanna let you know that June 22nd is the primary election and you can start to early vote on June 12th. So just so you know, and to get more information, please go to voting.nyc. Um, your registration deadline is this week. It is um, gonna be May 28th. So if you have not registered to vote or if you need to get people registered to vote, you have till May 28th to get that done. You can re request your absentee ballot all the way up until June 15th. And after June 15th, that is it because we're still in the pandemic, even though I know we can lift our mask and, and go out. I know I'm inching out. I'm still gonna be having my mask on. I know people are gonna make that choice for themselves, but some people are not gonna wanna come out. So you can still get an absentee a ballot request June 15th. And go. we have ranked choice now with the voting. So to learn about ranked choice, because it's going to be new what you see on the ballot of, as far as ranking the people that you want to vote for when you go into the booth, um, just go to that website I gave you earlier, voting NYC, voting.nyc, and they're gonna give you a rundown of the new voting um, by rank choice, because I don't want you to walk into the booth and just be surprised. And on the ballot, you're gonna see the mayor, public advocate, city council, borough president, and controller. So I just want everybody out there to research because there's a lot of people, you're gonna see a lot of names, and I just want you to go in there and have an idea of who you want to vote for. Again, voting.nyc. So I just want to get all of that out. and. So now onto my special guest that I'm excited to have come on. Um, you guys know how I like to do a fun fact before I bring on my guest. And um, one of the fun facts that I learned about Tracy, just researching her for this interview and discovering and learning new things, which I'm, I'm excited about, is that the, just the way that she inspires me because she has over a hundred credits like a, a list of lists of great, great work. And I've always been a fan of hers, even before I met her. And um, and and so it's just very inspirational just to see um, what she put out there comes back manifest because her resume is just very extensive and amazing and inspirational, I'll say that. And then she's known for throwing really great kick-ass parties, which I haven't been invited to because I'm on the East Coast, but she's known for throwing some parties. And so I hear people talk about, um, having a good time at, um, at one of Tracy Tom's parties. So I um, look forward to one of those one day, Al. But anyway, so listen, um, let's go ahead and get this interview started. I want everybody out there at home to put a round of applause for our girl, Tracy Tom. We're gonna bring her on and we're gonna get the party started. <laughs> hi, hi. <laughs> hey, honey. Hi, hi, hi. How are you holding up? I like to start each interview with like just a check in before we just get into to asking questions and everything. But how are you holding up? Because like I said in the intro, we we're coming out of there's like light at the end of the tunnel with this pandemic and and mask and everything how are you feeling with everything i don't know it's weird because la is like <laughs> la is like what pandemic mm. <laughs> like, it's like traffic is back to like as bad as it ever was you know smog is back um even though it was a very scary time yeah um there were some things that were kind of nice about having to, uh, to hit pause on the world you know what i mean i just wish it didn't have to come with like you know death and destruction yeah amen, <laughs> um, amen, amen. because i've always been a very like go 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 person like, i don't know how to stop i don't know how to sit down and just mm -hmm. do nothing which is a skill i realized like a year before the sorry the pandemic that i didn't have i you know someone got like a staycation for my birthday in like three days in a hotel but here i didn't have to travel yeah and i didn't know how to do it I was like stressed, like the whole time, like I'm missing something, something I have to do, whatever. I was like, I don't know how to do this. Yeah. Uh, so this world shutting down the way it did, it forced a lot of people, including me, to be like, oh, I have to be okay with like. Yeah, sitting. Yeah, that was my that was my journey as well because 
Um, I'm always going, going, going to hustle. And you know, New York, you know, yeah. I just, I walk everywhere. I got my backpack. I got five bags. I have my yeah. date with me. Yeah. And um, and just the pandemic forced me to slow down. And it was interesting because during the pandemic, I went to go walk to like CVS or something. Mm -hmm. And I just remember rushing to CVS. Everything was shut down. You know, CVS had the limited hours when it started to um, before it like this yep. pandemic got really crazy. Yep. And I just remember stopping myself in the middle of the street and forcing myself to just stop and take a yeah. breath. Cause I was like, Cherry, why are you, where are you rushing to? And nothing's open, just CVS, just you're going to the pharmacy. Why do you need to rush? And I was walking like it was like the, like the building was on fire. Yeah, like you had an appointment right afterwards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I had to really, I had to really, um, you know, retrain my brain to just go, okay, and oh, be okay with it and not feel guilty, right? There was a time where I was just like, if I wasn't doing anything, I go, I, I feel like I'm missing something, right? Something needs to happen. And so, yeah, yeah so I'm, I understand that completely because yeah, I literally was like, damn it. And I think what I learned is like, if, if everything's shut down, I have to, I have to not do anything. I'm yeah. actually really good at not doing anything. That was another thing I learned. I'm like, oh God, I'm too good at not good. This is why I rush around all the time. Because <laughs> I know on the other side of this is just kind of like playing video games long or like laying around in bed or whatever. You know? Yeah, yeah, binge watching. I've been I've been binge watching um a lot, a lot of shows and 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 laying in the bed as well. So I understand that. Yeah. Um so let I mean so let's get this started. I'm really excited about this interview because um, I've always had questions. I've always wanted to ask you, but we just the timing and we're both on two different coasts. And you wear so many different hats, you know, singer, actress, producer. I just want to know where did your love of the arts come from? How do we get? How do we come to know the Tracy Thompson today? So how did this start? Where did you get the bug? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was small. Um, um, my father worked for Maryland Public Television. So I always was surrounded by the arts. You know, my house, I was kind of bustling with new people and and uh, I was running around TV studios and I don't remember the first play I ever saw. Um, my father's on the board at Center Stage now in Baltimore. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've always been around the arts. So I knew I was gonna do something in the arts. I didn't think I was gonna be able to do it for a career. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I'll always do it for fun because I didn't really see anybody who looked like me doing it as a career at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unless it was a Cosby show. Um, that's real, amen. That's pretty much it, you know what I mean? Yeah. A real Cosby show or nothing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> or, yeah. Or after, <laughs> um, so yeah, I just started taking acting classes when I was nine. I wasn't very good. I wasn't one of these good kids who's like, oh, wow, you're a star. No, I was not. <laughs> I mean, it was like acting, singing, and dance. But mm -hmm. I just loved it so much, I just kept doing it. And eventually I got better. Um, you know, my father always laughs at me because, um, and my mother, um, but my mom's a social worker, so she's very, you know. Okay. <laughs> but I was doing Big River. Oh, wow. I was doing that music, I was 18. <laughs> Sorry, doing Big River. And, um, in West Maryland, and I had to sing this like gospel song. Now, you know, <laughs> up until then, my voice had been like my parents just kind of endured it because I was always singing in the room. And um, <clears throat> and then when I tried to start developing a voice, I had one of those really annoying like Broadway canny voices, <laughs> like loud and too much, much vibrato, and like too you know, and I have any soul in my voice. I was just like. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to sing this like gospel song and started off stage. So mm -hmm. it starts off stage and then mm -hmm. I'm on. So I started it and they were in the audience like, who that? Who's that singing? That's not no, that's not our child. And then I come all like cross and you like, Ooh. like, like, like really give you slavery and, <laughs> and, and oppression. <laughs> that was all of 18. Wow. Um, and at that point, they were just like, oh, I guess that clicked. I guess she can sing now. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or I was like, she, you know, she can carry a tune or whatever. It's fine. But like that, because I just kept working at it. And the gift that they gave me, they never told me I was bad. They did not tell me I was tone deaf. They didn't tell me it was not good. But let me ask you this. The people in your um, family, were, were any singers or, or were you the first singer? No, my grandmother was a singer. Okay. Um, but she died when I was three. 
Mm-hmm. So, but when I sing, a lot of people, of course, who knew her, like you sound like her. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, my dad sings a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, brother sings a bit. My brother's a, a, a rapper and a DJ. He's a musician for sure. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, <clears throat> And on my mother's side, I have an aunt who made a record when I was young. She was a oh, wow, okay. little gospel record, but it was like back in the day gospel. Not like. Not you know, like Kurt Franklin, like they were like, some don't bump bump Kurt Franklin, not like Kurt Franklin gospel. No, like, <laughs> low. Yeah. It was like. Yes. It's like I'm reminding my grandmother, um, my family's from the South, Louisiana, and it reminds me of my grandmother. Um, sitting in the front row because my grandfather was a deacon of a Southern Baptist church uh-huh. and my grandmother would be in her all white nurse's outfit and like the, the my little Lord, he heard my cry. Yeah, just I, all I, of that. I, <laughs> but we, I didn't really grow up in church church. I, mean, yeah, I went yeah. to my grandmother sometimes, but mm-hmm. my parents were a little bit more progressive. They're like, hey, if you want to go, yeah, go. There was a church around the corner, but it was Presbyterian. So even then it oh, was Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> So in my grandmother's church, everybody was really, really old. So nobody was like given. I was. I didn't have like this experience. You didn't have like the like, mm, 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 French shoulders. Church, French church, I was like, oh, this is. <laughs> <laughs> you like okay now I'm gonna come to this church. Yes, it's like a concert every weekend. But I bet you have to learn that. I bet you have to learn how to do it because then when you're a black performer, they always want you to do that. I mean, church. amen. You know, and then now and then we have to be like, I'm not doing that. It was, do 80, that. it was the 80s. It was the 80s, right? <laughs> Him up, walk him up, walk him up. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. Oh my goodness. Okay. So it's appropriate. It's Sunday. It's appropriate. That I love it. I love it. I love it. So you you get the bug, you're singing, you're doing all these amazing things. You go to Howard and then end up in Juilliard, and then yeah. you decide, okay, I'm this is for I'm doing this for a living. And yeah, that was a very hard uh, transition to make. Yeah, talk to me about that. Well, sorry, I'm getting some water. I'm gonna okay, yes, yeah. I'm so sorry, I keep coughing. I'm gonna get some. I'm gonna drink some water as well. Let's hydrate this. Take mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> like a little tickle. All right. Mm-hmm. Um. So okay, so I started uh, acting in class. When I was nine. Then at uh, at the Baltimore Actors Theater, but I was the only black girl there. Mm-hmm. They really didn't know how to <clears throat> serve me. Mm-hmm. So my dad pulled me out and put me in Arena Players. We'll talk about Arena Players later a little bit. But um, so I, I grew up like in this black community theater. Um, <clears throat> and I just loved it so much. And then high school came and I went to a regular high school and all my friends from Arena Players went to Baltimore School for the Arts. And they were like literally in fame. And I was literally the most jealous I'd ever been in my life. So I switched. Wow, yeah. I don't blame you. I switched sophomore year, then I was like, well, I'm in fame too. Yeah. <laughs> went there, Jada Pinkett went there. <clears throat> mm, mm. Some great, two of the great, two greats. Yeah. Um, yeah. They were a cycle ahead of me though. So I didn't go to school with them, but mm-hmm. they came back to visit. It was, they weren't far enough out of school, but they didn't come back and visit. Gotcha. Um, so, and then I got in a, it was time for college. I got in Howard, but I was a communications major at Howard, um, radio TV film, because I kept running from this acting thing. Mm. So setting myself for failure if I go after acting. Because again, didn't see anybody like me. My, at this point, we were in the 90s. <clears throat> and it was the same five people in every movie. You know what I mean? Amen, amen. that's real. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like, they had like a company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Long, Sonali, annotated. Yeah. It was all of them. It was like, yeah. Was just them from movie to movie. Yeah. Um, so, um, I was like, well, that's not, <clears throat> there's no room for me, really. I didn't see the, I didn't see the space for it at the time. There, there actually wasn't. Um, so I kept trying to run from it. And plus, you know, I d- doubt, I didn't think I was very good. I was never one of the the girls who was celebrated. Um, I was just like always in class. I was a, was a good, like, supporting player in class. But I was never yeah. like, oh, Trace is so good. Oh, Trace is the star. Oh, Trace is so good. I was never that. I was always kind of under the radar, just doing my work. Wow. <clears throat> it's hard to believe because it's like, oh my God, Tracy's in my head. I'm like, Tracy's a star. She's so amazing. And I'm like, that's stuff, yeah. <laughs> but I never, I never felt that way. Um, yeah. I felt like I just wasn't quite good enough. Mm-hmm. So I kept having to try harder. Um, and then my third semester at Howard, my father introduced me to somebody and he was like, this is my daughter, Tracy. She's a theater major at Howard. And I was like, that, stop. You know, <laughs> he, oh, right. Sorry. She's a real TV film. <laughs> 
and like shamed me. He shamed me in front of a person I didn't know. It was like, why are you doing? I don't even know why you're doing this, Tracy. You just want to act. You know, you're just doing this out of fear. Mm. Gonna work? Do you think you're gonna work your work all the time? Mind you, working all the time then was like doing community plays in the air, doing local stuff. But they always wanted me in them. They mm -hmm. were always casting me. I was like, yeah, but I'm not making any money. <laughs> Fuck. So I switched my major. Mm -hmm. I mean, doing that, switching my major to acting was like, well, either it's gonna work or it's not. <clears throat> Hopefully, I won't be homeless. You know? Yeah. And then I got in, and um, then I went to British American Drama Academy and studied Shakespeare for a summer. And I, I did really just heightened the whole thing back up again. And then I got into Juilliard. But I had a whole existential crisis my last year at Juilliard. I was in the psych services and with the therapist. Like, what am yeah. I doing? I'm going to fail. No one's going to hire me. I've set myself up for failure. Wow. Mm. Fear, because still, Early, I mean, this now we're at the early 2000s. Yeah. There still weren't movies for us. Yeah. All the movies right then were like gangster movies, uh, basketball movies, a lot of sport yeah. movies, a lot of rapper movies with a whole bunch of dudes and one girl. And yeah. the girl was always like hot. Yeah. It was like a mob, like a, like a hot, hot thing. Yeah. And I've never been that. And I'm like, I'm the cute girl next door. And if I was a white girl, they'd be space for me. They'd be the Renee Zellweger's, the Reese Witherspoon's or whatever. But they don't have that for black girls. Yeah. So you gotta be hot or busted and you were like i ain't trying to be busted so but i'm honestly yeah we're gonna keep it real 100 yeah i want to keep it real 100 i'm too light-skinned to be busted Oops. it will never they won't even consider it won't even consider it but you like you could do that like you could get oh. in there yeah, I'll, listen, I, you know, I'm just saying, I, the Tracy that I know could just be like, you know, I, yeah, us. <laughs> at that time, specifically, yeah. it was crazy. And I was like, I didn't real. I mean, that colorism, of course, is the thing that I've always been aware of. Wrote a whole paper on it when I was at Howard. But in the industry, it didn't really, really hit me. Because I'm like, well, I'm black. Yeah. So coming up until then, locally, it was a slave show. Mm -hmm. I was in a slave show. <clears throat> you know, it was a show yeah. about about hardships that black people face. I'm black, I'm in those shows. But the bigger industry, it's like, if you're, if they're, if they're telling stories of like, real uh, period pieces with black people specifically, um, of going through stuff, they literally really, if it's a hardship story about hardships that black people face and they really veer towards dark skinned people. If there's mm -hmm. no black girl, best friend black girl. Yeah. Then it gets, the skin thing gets lighter. But I was really like, wow, you know, and all these things that, that have happened, you know what I mean? It's like, and I was always kind of in the middle because there were the girls who were like mulatto, like mm -hmm. the racial thing. I'm not quite that. I would go in and I'm like, oh no, but that girl next to you is actually biracial and I can tell the difference. I'm like, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I have to just be light skinned. Yeah. Or lighter yeah. skinned, you know what I mean? I'm, and I have light skinned people in my life. Like, you ain't light skinned, you, you pose. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know, right? There's all these grades to it, right? Yeah. Like, not, you know, you're not Colorism, and it's real. It's real. It's a real thing. Yeah, so I'm like, oh, the fact that we, we still are doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I mean, there's it goes both ways. And I understand the celebration of melanin. I understand it and I love it. I love it. You know what I mean? But it, it can backlash in another way. That's just like, okay, well, that's what's happening now. <laughs> you know, people are like, you want dark, 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 dark skinned women on camera. And I'm like, yes. Can I do something? Can, but can I get can I get a part though? Can yeah. I get a part? No, I, mean, I, hear, I hear you on that. I do. I promise, I promise you in 1953. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think I'm doing? A stenographer? No, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be a man, probably. But anyway. Um. I just kept doing it. I just kept not stopping. That was a whole nother tangent. I didn't, I didn't No, I love, no, this is good. This is good. Cause it's, it's, it's so, it's, it's so inspirational because, um, you, cause one of the things I, I like about you and, um, you inspire me is that you will go, you will keep going and keep going and go after it, which I love. And so with you coming out of Juilliard and doing theater and, one of the things I want to talk about is stick fly because of the fact that the way it inspired me when I was in the audience, um, I was there opening night and um, you, I just, you were just, you're so, I mean, you're good at everything. Like I love, I love watching you on TV and I love watching you on stage, but I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about this, about stick fly and your experience on this, about just 
that part and being on Broadway and, and carrying this play. Um, and the second half of this question is, do you prefer TV, film, the theater, even coming out of Juilliard? Are you a, do you consider yourself a theater girl or are you I'm a TV film kind of girl? But talk to me about, a little bit about your experience with Stick Fly first. Okay, Stick Fly was crazy. It's a crazy yeah. experience. I mean, it's, it's kind of like twofold because on the one hand, it's like, oh, you're like you're you're the lead of the show. You know, mm -hmm. I've really been a lead before, really. Um, not not on anything on a large scale like that. So I was like, okay, well, I have to do this thing. But the thing that was challenging about Stick Fly and um, it was playing a character that was very misunderstood, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I felt like the character was very much misunderstood by the other characters in the play. And then I felt like she was kind of understood to much of the, like the critics and things like that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like why, why is she so uh, uh, uptight? Why is she so um, <clears throat> like angsty? Because people don't know what to do with angsty black girls. And that's real, amen. You know, so you had this girl who was dealing with a mental health issue who was working on it and it was just, you know, she just had anxiety. She had like a, a, a nervous breakdown in school and so she was kind of wound tight and um, she had had abandonment issues from dealing with her father and all this stuff like that. So she was a little, <laughs> yeah, she was a, lot, she was a lot, you know, she was always trying too hard. But sometimes people misunder, mistook that for like me, the actor, mm -hmm. like Tracy just trying too hard. I'm like, what, the, the in the play, all the characters <laughs> say about my character Taylor. <laughs> Yes. You know, she she's she's nice. She just tries too hard. I'm like, see, I was doing my job. Yes. Yeah. Aren't used to it. So it was really interesting because you know, you, you go into these things and you expect you want I mean you want everything to be like you know, Yeah. You you know, and but you have to just hunker down and stay on course and do your job. But you have these high hopes for Yeah. This thing to like break your whole uh career open. And the play was just largely kind of misunderstood by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um particularly who aren't black. Black people got it. Yeah. We understand the whole like, Jack and Jill background, blah, 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 the privileged black people in Martha's Vineyard. You know, we, we know that story, particularly for East Coast. Um, a lot of people didn't get it. So it was like, I, you know, I made these relationships, these friendships that are just lasting forever. You know what I mean? I learned a lot about myself as an artist and mm -hmm. my process and um, how to be easy on myself. I mean, I was- mm, That's important, how to be easy, so yeah. hard, you know, going through so hard on myself going into that show and I was like, hmm, I'm driving myself crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, and it's funny, and part of that is baked into the role because I talked to another girl, uh, Jessica Francis Dukes. But, That's our girl. Yeah, yeah. I love her, yeah. Well, I had the same experience. I thought I was losing my mind. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. So it's like in the show. Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's not just, it's not me. It's not me, okay, yeah. Because everybody's undermining you the whole show. You know what I mean? Everybody thinks yeah. you're, you're, you're crazy and and you're trying to prove you're not crazy and you start thinking like you are crazy, you know? Yeah. It, it was crazy. It was, I mean, <laughs> it was, it's trying to be very meta. Um, so I had to learn how to take care of myself after mm. that. But I had to learn how to be easy with myself. And my next play I did after that was Lost Lake, which is a two-hander with John. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that, was, that was another part, Lost Lake, that play. Yeah, and that girl was going through it too. But by then I had learned that just take every day at a time. We'll see what happens. You know, these are things I thought I knew before Stick Fly. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then I was like, oh, no, I have to keep learning that lesson. You know, I have to keep learning how to. Yeah, self-care. Be easy. Yeah. And yeah. Trust myself and, you know. Well, doing all these, doing the, the, the theater, like the Lost Lakes and the Stick Flies and then all the um, um, movies and TV shows you've done, do you have a favorite or do you are you just like you just go where your flow is or do you feel like you'll always be a theater girl i think i'll always be a theater girl but it's funny because once you get away from doing theater yeah then you go back that, that thing is whoo it's like grueling like the stamina really yeah the stamina yeah. takes to go to rehearsal for like six hours a day for weeks and weeks and weeks and then doing the show eight times a week during that whole journey. And if you're doing something like emotional or mm -hmm. physical, um, as you get older, it's like, but I could just go to set real quick. And <laughs> <laughs> you're like, let me just go ahead and do this, pull out these four hours real quick and then I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Take as much as I'm making for this entire run of this play. You know what I mean? Yeah, amen, that's real. You're balancing that. So, uh, I, and, and while that juxtaposition is, uh, 
is there and the job i was people always ask me like what's the difference but the job is the same the job is you know find the truth and tell it and that's it yeah yeah take up given circumstances you find the truth of it and you tell it the only thing that changes is how the story is put together because when you're doing a movie or tv you're doing it in pieces you're not doing the whole thing yeah um and but mostly in terms of just the acting part of it yeah the difference is how far away the audience is from you Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm telling it to in a close-up that requires a certain amount of energy. If I'm telling it in like an amphitheater, you know, yeah. probably a bowl that takes a different kind of energy. And that's really all that's different. And of course it affects your body, your technique. Yeah. Of course, but con conceptually it's the same thing. And I just love what I do. Good. Yeah, no, I can tell but within your work, you know, just watching the gift that you leave behind when we're watching you work, watching you work, I can tell that you love it. So, um, and that's part of the inspiration, right? Because so, um, my experience is the few that I've had on set, I just, I'm full of anxiety and I'm just like, she just has so much ease and there's just, and I know like, you know, it's for any artist to make things look simple is not easy, but I just feel like you have that gift. So I just want, I want to say that to you. you um, know, I have a, um, a trainer, I have a, a Muay Thai trainer. I sort of mm -hmm. kickboxing again. Okay, yes. And he's also a writer. So he says, mm -hmm. what we're gonna do is uh it's easy. And he goes, sorry, it's not simple. Yeah. Um, and some of the simplest things are the hardest. Yes. Uh so I'm like, I'm taking that into my entire life. It's simple. Yeah. Yeah. I always want to try to come to things as, as simply as you can. Um, but you learn along the way. Like what I learned working with Rosario <clears throat> on rent, she didn't have a lot of like acting class mm -hmm. experience or like yeah. training. You know, after that I kind of became her pseudo trainer for a little bit. Um yeah, so um uh but she had no change in energy from the moment before action and when they had action. Mm -hmm. Like Cl Clint Eastwood, for example, doesn't say action. He says they go set, cameras are set. Wow. You just go when you go. Wow. Wow. Okay. Because he knows that action causes tension, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Action. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> but I learned from Rosario, she has no, nothing changes, nothing shifts. She's just as easeful when they say action and she just moves right through it. And I'm like, you like that. I'm going to take that. Learn that we learned a lot from each other too. Also, like she'll be the setup thing. She was like, "You're giving all this, all this." It was her take me or leave me. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, so I come down the stairs. You know, yeah. Turn around to Adina to say one thing to her, and then I turn around and walk in the room. Mm -hmm. I wasn't turn around and walking in the room. On that line, you know, I was still kind of giving it to to Adina, and then Rosario was like, "Tracy, look at these cameras. They're not going to turn around to get them." You got to turn another way. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, okay. We've already shot in this direction. We're not coming back around to get that. So she's like, I need to I need to look the other way, baby. I need you to go the other way. I think that's amazing. And so I'm glad I'm glad we're on the subject of rent. Like the picture that Bjorn had put up earlier is you, the Tango Marina. And I love that picture of you. That's why I wanted to show it. Um, but the story behind the full circle moment of rent with you going after it, you auditioned for like seven or eight times and you kept coming back. You kept coming back. And then full circle moment, you get in and you get in the movie. And so I just want to ask you, what is it about Rent that you love that you went after it seven to eight times? And when you were going for it, were you going for Joanne? Is Was Joanne the part? And you're like, oh my God, this is the part? Or were you just like, I just want to be in this this amazing um, musical? Um, so talk to me about that, you know, because the drive, some people would not go seven to eight times. Yeah, I mean, yes. <laughs> yes. I started auditioning from, okay. I'll try to do my rent story fast this long. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of pieces to it, but I saw rent in 97. Mm -hmm. So cast, I couldn't, I sat in the theater afterwards and just could not move. I just mm -hmm. sat there like weeping. And I was not an emotional person then. I'm generally speaking, I'm not like an emotional person in general. Mm -hmm. But, um, but, um, I, for it to move me that way was atypical, you mm -hmm. know? 
there's people that cries all the time, you know? So that's the context for that. And I was like, I have to be in the show. I've never seen people look like me in a show. Mm -hmm. People who feel like real people um, going through a struggle that I knew, you know, I live, we, you know, lived through yeah. the pandemic. So and that was real. Um, <clears throat> And I was like, I have to tell the story. It's just so important. You know, I mean, I didn't really know La Boheme at the time, you know, mm -hmm. it, I, would have, I would have a more of a context to all of it, but it was, it just completely blew me away. Um, it was gritty. It was important. Uh, and I was like, I have to be in this. I didn't care where I was. I didn't care if I was like in the background sweeping. I didn't care. I didn't, yeah. I was like, honest living, honest living. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I feel. I, I would to, to interject for two seconds. That's how I feel about Hamilton. I can't sing or dance, but I was like, I'll just be bullet. I'll just carry the bullet. I'll carry the I'll just carry that bullet in Hamilton. <laughs> I just do that moment. Like yes. <laughs> but then I look at I look at her and I'm like, oh Ariana, that was hard. You had to hold it yeah. back. You're still that's a lot of control. We can do that. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> All this stuff is happening for her. Anyway. <laughs> We're talking about Ariana DeBose, by the way, who was- Yes, who are what, yes. <laughs> you know, West Side Story. Anyway, yeah. uh, <clears throat> so I just, you know, I just became, I was on a mission. And then I, at the time I was doing Joseph at the Major Technicolor Dreamcoat mm -hmm. in, in Columbia, Maryland at Toby's Dinner Theater. Um, and shout out Toby Dinner Theater. <laughs> <laughs> doing the narrator alternate, but the girl who was the real, I was just at the matinees. Mm -hmm. but she was out one Monday, I mean, she was out one Sunday. So I did two shows on that Sunday, got in the car, drove to New York with some friends and stood in line all night long to audition for Rent. Wow. Of 97, stood in line, you know, so just to give you some context. So yeah. <clears throat> the audition was at 440 Lafayette, which is across the street from the public. Yes. Right? The line at 5 a.m. to audition for Rent was all the way down to 4th Street, all the way over to Broadway, and wrapped around to the McDonald's. Shut it up. Right? I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. That was the line to audition for rent at 5 a.m. when I got in line. Wow. Cold. It was April, early April. You know, it's still cold in New York. Yeah. I stood in line all night long. All night. And I got all the way around, almost to like maybe 10 minutes before I was supposed to go in. I went to speak. No voice. <gasps> <clears throat> Nothing like, huh? and I had never lost my voice before. Wow, I could lose it. I didn't understand how people could lose their voices because I was just screaming, screaming, screaming. I mean, I was doing Beehive before that. I was doing Tina Turner screaming Beehive, and it was like, yeah, fine. I never lost my voice before, so at that moment, I was like, yeah. okay, all right, you know, yeah. God, but God said, nah, yeah, not today, not today, not on this day. And my voice was gone for a week. I couldn't get it back or whatever. But a friend of mine, uh, David St. Louis, he had also gone up to rent, to audition for rent because I made him. Because I was like, I know a part you're going to get. You're going to be Collins or you're going to be cover. So you're going to go in line. So he was like way ahead of me in line. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was like, I have to go. I have to go home. I can't sing. You know, I drove all the way back. Wow. <clears throat> and then he, he booked it. Like I knew he would. He booked it. So then when they came to DC doing auditions uh, later that year, he got me an appointment with Bernie Telsey. Like, so I didn't have to do the whole line thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so he got me an appointment and I went in and I sang, um, I don't want to be alone tonight from school days. Yes. <laughs> That's, I don't want to be alone tonight. I can't sing, but listen, was, trying, trying to sing in front of you, but I yes. Go, <laughs> I go to the library to find that song because it was not published. I did that, and then Bernie was like, "Can you sing Take Me, Leave Me, Go Outside, Take Me, Leave Me, Sing a Little Seasons of Love, or whatever?" And that started the come back in every, you know. At this yeah. point, I'd gotten into Juilliard, and I was supposed to be starting Juilliard um, in August, but my final callback was in August, and I was doing hair in DC, um, so I was going up and up and back. But then I was I was still having vocal problems after that because hair, of course, is screaming and yeah, hair, yeah. you know, <clears throat> that was Sheila Franklin in hair, and then you know. Um, had a final call back for rent um, the week before I started. Uh, the, we started orientation for Juilliard. I was on vocal rest. Wow. I have a final call back for rent. And if I get it, I'm not going to be here. So if you didn't, if you got into rent, you would not have gone to Juilliard. Exactly. That would have been a mistake. But I would have mm, You would have uh, done but, it. But I would have done it. Um, I would have made the choice to shred my voice. And who knows where I'd be right now. Because I didn't yeah. know what, That's why I kept losing my voice. I was just screaming, you know. Yeah. Um, that's what happens. You're a black girl singer. They just want you to sing, sing loud and high all the time. Yeah. 
Uh, we don't get to we don't get those little nuanced songs, you know. Y yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Particularly back then, but then I went to Juilliard instead, and then as soon as I graduated from Juilliard, I got right back in rotation. Wow. And they just kept calling me in. Uh, Spike Lee was doing a movie of it. I went after Spike, and he loved me. He thought I was too young. Um, and, and what it came down to, I think I was just too young for Joanne. I'm very right for Joanne. I'm very mm -hmm. energetically and um, for Joanne, even though I always wanted to be a badass Mimi, but I know I'm not Mimi. You know, <laughs> when I was super skinny. And, I can see you as a Mimi, totally. Yeah, I could do it, but that's not my, just, that's not my standing energy. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely Joanne. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> and then... Um, Finally, I was opening one more time, and Bernie was like, we're going to get you in the show. And I was like, you know what? I don't even want to be a little show no more. <laughs> <laughs> At that point. <laughs> and then he was also casting the movie. I'm like, all right, this is my last audition for this. If I, if, you know. Mm -hmm. I audition for the movie. Um, uh, it was September 23rd, uh, 2004. Wow. That movie. And then I just let it go. Like, really. And then I'm, I forgot about it. I was like, and Queen Latifah was going to get her or something like that. And then I was like, <laughs> and that, um, he, he loved my tape. I was going to find out the next day whether it was going to be me or whether I was going to test for it. I was like, <laughs> that's cute. No, I'm not kidding. You know, uh, yeah. I had this horrible, um, I had this horrible uh, commercial audition. I was leaving in the low, on the Lower East Side. I was leaving the audition. It was like, kind of, you know, you go to ones, so you're like, this is humiliating one. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I have many of those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was leaving that, and I was literally on the Lower East Side, and then my phone rang, and it was like my mate, my 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 manager and my agent, and they were like, "You tell her, no, you tell her, no, you tell her." I was like, "Somebody fucking tell me." <laughs> I know I'm trying to cast. No, I mean, listen, please. <laughs> and then they were like, "You got red," and I just like blacked out or something. I just started screaming and cussing in the street. And I, called <laughs> Fox. I called everybody I ever met, you know. Um. You know, and then it was really, and that was before I knew I was going to be doing the original cast. That it, yeah. You know, you know, I was like, oh, they're doing all unknowns? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's, is that how I got in? Oh, no, no, you're doing with Adina. I'm sorry, what? Wow. You know, and then we did that, and then I booked Cold Case, and I was on Cold Case for years, and then they were closing right on Broadway, and they were like, hey, would you like to come and do the closing cast of Rents? Mm -hmm. Never did it on Broadway, and I was like, "Well, I'm a cold case. Cold case, like, we'll let you do it. We'll just write around it." I'm like, "Are you serious?" So wow. I was back and forth doing Broadway rent on Broadway, and then doing cold case and asking people questions about whether they killed people a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, let's talk about the cold case because this is an amazing story, and the fact that I didn't realize that you were doing rent and cold case at the same time, yeah. and the reason why I wanted to ask you about cold case is because my mom, my mom loves the show to this day. <laughs> She like when I told her that I was I'm gonna be interviewing you. She was so excited. She I, I'm pretty sure it's like Cold Case and the Golden Girls for her. I so, mean, so you're in good company, Tracy. You're a good company. Golden Girls quality TV. <laughs> so talk to me about the, um, playing Cat Miller and what um and the reason why I picked this scene because it's just it's just the the subject matter and intensity, but the um just your work on this show was so good and my mother loves you on this. What was it about Cat Miller that you liked? Well, I went in for a, a girl, um, a girl, another cop before her and didn't get it. Mm -hmm. So I went to the audition for this and they were like, we want her to have personality. I'm like, but y'all didn't write personality. Oh, amen. This wasn't in the text. Mm -hmm. What we ended up doing after I said the whatever lines they had for me, because Kat was supposed to be Irish. She was supposed to be an Irish. Oh, wow. Girl, okay. Uh, white girl. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot what my last name was supposed to be. It was something real Irishy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, and so I just went in and after the audition, um, Meg Simon, who uh, cast it, she was like, okay, just start, just talk, talk like you. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us about yourself. Where are you from? I'm like, oh, I'm from Baltimore. I'm this and whatever, blah, blah, blah. You know, just kind of like, was me. Yeah. And I think they finally, they, and then they cast me as it. Nice. So I feel like I could bring a lot of myself to it, which gave me a lot of freedom with that role. Yeah, which I liked. You can see that. Because I didn't know, that hearing the story now, it makes sense because I didn't realize it was, I mean, it makes sense in the sense of like, of course, it was written with a white person in mind. But you came in and was like, and knocked that out of the park. And they're like, we want her, which I think, I think is amazing. 
Yeah, and I think her last name was Brennan. That was her last name. Mm -hmm. was Kate Brennan. Brennan or Eve Brennan or something. And they were like, ah, no, we'll make her cat. Look, Look at that picture. picture. I love that picture of you. I had to put it in. <laughs> I was like, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, badge, that was, you see my badge? Yeah, you was like showing that badge, girl. I was like, yes, look at that badass. Yeah, look at it over there. Um, so let's talk about you doing this web series, Send Me. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because, you know, I love the fact that, you know, you're doing all these amazing pieces. And then it's like a friend can call you and like, Cho, Tracy, can you come do this web series? And you're like, yeah, sure. I love the fact, because there's a lot of actors in your position who would not do that for whatever reason, the ego, they don't want, they're like, they are above it. And I've always found you approachable. Even when I met you, you've always just been that girl. And I love that about you. So I'm not surprised that you said yes to this web series. Um, but the reason why I wanted to bring it up is because the subject matter of it about asking the question, if you could go back to slavery, would you? And I just want to ask you, I just wanted to ask you, what was that like? being in, in a web series about that very topic and how did you deal with that as Tracy playing going through that like what did you come up with would you go back that's you know it's like because it's a it's a question that I don't think a lot of us have asked and then there's some people out there who are like well if I was in slavery I get the whip and I whip the masses ass you know it's that kind of thing but what, what was your journey like for this well it's interesting the thing that was actually the most interesting about it because I started asking people that question you know? yeah um so for people who don't know, Send Me is about, I'm this woman who has some kind of magic powers to um, send people back to experience slavery um, for a finite amount of time. Um, and, the, and actually the reasons why people said yes were fascinating, you know, they yeah. were from like, well, I've studied slavery my whole life. I'm a professor, I'm this, I'm that. And I wanna see if the things I've been teaching are true. Mm -hmm. That was one of the more logical reasons, I think. Someone who dedicated their lives and written books about slavery. So, well, let me go see it, you know? Yeah. Um, but it was like one woman said, I want to go back to just don't want to think about anything. I just want to know what to do. Wow. Okay. Okay. All right. Wow. So, I kind of surrender. Yeah. You know, a lot of people want to go back and start a revolution and kill people, but you can't do that because that's a whole time space continuum and you can't change things. About <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Do that. So we had this extensive interview process to find the people. Um, so it was really interesting. Me, Tracy Thomas, would I go back to slavery? No. <laughs> no, no, not a little, no. <laughs> problem, but, I mean, Black Matter and all, but I mean, I amen. Amen. Yes. <laughs> so no, 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 I don't. You know, oh, and there's one girl who, one woman was like, I've done the past life regression. Um, wow. The slavery and actually everything was cool, you know, because she was like, well, I want to go back to my plantation mm -hmm. where it was. Mm -hmm. That was one of those plantations where, you know, the masters treated us well and fed us well or whatever. And I'm like, uh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, no, no, thank you. You know, but when you watch the series, there's a reason why she's sending people back. There's a reason. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a personal reason for it. Um, well, people are gonna have to watch the series to, um, to know because we're not. We don't want to give any spoilers away or anything like, like that. But talk to me. Did you see the Emmy nomination coming? No, not at all. He told me he was like, "Hey, I'm submitting for an Emmy," and I was like, "Okay, waste your money if you want." You know, yeah. I Steve uh, Harper who did that show. I we did. He was a local celebrity in Baltimore. Like he was on a kid show, one of those after school wrap around kid shows. You know, what I mean? gotcha, like, yeah. Like, the cartoons would play. They were like, we're in the clubhouse. Coming up next is blah, 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 blah. Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, and then he went to Juilliard uh, for writing. But before mm -hmm. that, fun fact, Steven yeah. an episode of America's Most Wanted together. Shut it up. That's I love that. Yeah, he was the he was the victim. You know what I mean? And my boyfriend was the one who killed him. You know, but I didn't even have a name. I had like I was like short shorts. <laughs> Oh my and gosh. I was terrible. Aaron, I was terrible. Like I'm, I want to find it so people can can believe you can get better. <laughs> wow. I was like, I didn't see so that. Bad. I didn't see that. That clip at all. <laughs> I was so bad. We were both so bad. We laughed because we, like, we thought we were acting. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we were giving it to you. <laughs> we were giving madness. That's what we were giving you. Um <laughs> so anyway. So we've known each other for all these years because of yeah. that. 
those connections. And he, he pitched it to me. And I was like, wait, what? Um, but that was during a year where I wasn't doing a series regular. I was like really piecemealing my career together and uh, really kind of struggling financially. But um, that happens. It's, it's peaks and valleys, right? So yeah, I'll, totally. On my house and moved back to New York. Okay. It was like that year. Yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah, but I will always say yes. If I can make it work, with, particularly with my friends who I trust, because, you know, we always talk about in school, um, when you, the people you meet in school, the people you want to come up with and they're your peers. So make sure you keep those relationships tight. Yeah. Sure, whatever. And I've always been a believer of like, no, you do what you do and I do what I do. Yeah. I'm an actor, but that doesn't mean I'm going to be a good writer. Yeah. You know, and usually you could tell when some actor has written some vehicle for themselves trying to get noticed. It's like, oh, you're just trying to, no. Yeah. Put yourself <laughs> upon. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I know who are brilliant writers. Yeah. So them do what they do, and I'm going to work on and, and keep honing what I do. And then we're going to come together and everybody eats, right? Yeah. So, um, so, yes, we asked. I was like, sure. And then I got some of my friends in it, and we all kind of got to work together. And he told me that he was submitting for an Emmy. And at this point, that category didn't exist. Yeah. I didn't, so I didn't know what he was talking about. He was like, I'm, I'm submitting an Emmy. I'm like, well, that's ridiculous, but okay. Um, I, wasn't, I didn't think about it again. Mm-hmm. And then the morning the, the nominations came out. It was the first year for this category. Wow. Look at you being the, you better go. Okay. Yeah. I didn't win it. But I listen, it, listen, 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 it, listen, you're going to turn around and you're going to be like, what's this statue? Who is this? Well, you know, we'll see. Um, but it was, it was quite shocking. That was 2016. It was quite shocking. And I was in, I was headed to New York to do falsettos. Um, mm -hmm. On Broadway, so I had to like leave rehearsal for Rossettos to go do this like Emmy red carpet, and I'm just on the red carpet like, <laughs> what, is the face? like Yo, what, what is face? happening? None of those I'm like, but you just never know. Like that's the, the beauty yeah. of it is like you never know, and you just and it was like you just say yes to to the, the work and to good and and you just want to do good work and you don't think about that and you're like, where the hell did that come from? Yeah, I was really interested in exploring the question. Yeah, um, that's a good question. That's all. Um, and it was something to do. But more than something to do, I thought it was really interesting. Yeah. And compelling. And I try to not do anything that's um, typical. Yeah, yeah. But the things that I do with my friends, but I don't I don't hang around with basic people anyway. Nobody's... Uh, okay. Mm, mm. That dance is like, we're not basic. We're not basic. Uh, <laughs> Because there's so much basic stories out there. So yeah. much of, of people telling the same story, you know, and I'm like, no. Um, so I align myself with people to tell different stories or, or really try to illuminate the human condition in a new way um, for people that happen to be black, not yeah. black people. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. And this is why I want to get into 911 because of the fact that the humanity and the choices that you make and the characters that you play. Mm -hmm. Karen Wilson married to what, what people call Mama Hen because of the, 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 your children and played by Aisha Hines, who was amazing and as Harriet Tubman in the underground. Yeah, and you guys are playing, you know, you guys are married to each other, you're playing wives to each other. And you now you've decided, your character decided to foster, but out of this painful journey. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to talk to you about this because speaking of the characters that you, cho you, you choose and the humanity that you bring to it, I mean, I just I I I've watched the show, but watching this season, I just cried every episode, especially the way when um I don't want I don't want to give spoilers, but just the way um Mama Hen was with her mother, mm -hmm. just that moment of just the humanity of just the love and like you're saying, they just happen to be black, but they're just living their lives and just doing what they do. Yeah. Talk to me about this because showing children can be loved by good parents is the key to this and well, I love this. I've known Aisha for a long time. She and I trust each other a whole lot. You know, when I told her I was going in for it, I was like, hey, I'm, I'm going in to play your wife. She goes, oh my God, no. I told her afterwards. Okay. I so. so I went in, I left, then I texted her. Uh -huh. I just went in to play your wife. She goes, oh, please, 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 please. I'm calling Tim Minear right now. <laughs> so Tim Minear, who's one of the producers on that show, um, he uh, he was one of the creators of a show, my second series ever, which was Wonder Falls from back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, it was also a very fun, quirky show. Um, so I've known Tim for years. He put me in another show, but then I couldn't do it because I booked rent, so I couldn't do that show. You know what I mean? So we've been kind of like doing this dance for a while. Yeah. Man, you know, he wrote me this long thing. Goes, I know, I used to think she chose you, but I don't. <laughs> I love it. You think she chose you. That's okay. <laughs> but 
Um, <clears throat> and because of that, because he and I have that shorthand, I think, um, you know, the character I played before on Wonder Falls wasn't written to be a black girl. They just kind of, you know, they just wanted a black girl for it, but it wasn't, it didn't get too, mm -hmm. you know, when it, when it, uh, present, when it came up, I would say, okay, it's okay to say this now. Cause yeah. 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 Say this. yeah. Okay, great. You know what I mean? Cause they gave me like a white love interest on that show played by Lee Pace, who was also a very good friend of mine. But I'm like, okay, well I have to acknowledge the fact that this is an interracial relationship. I can't act like it's not. Yeah. 2004. 2004. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, people are going to notice. People are going to notice. It's a very special episode, but let's not pretend that it's, it's not right there. Exactly. Yeah. I, I promise you, if I date a white guy, we're going to talk about the fact that he's white, not black. It's going to come up. Yeah. Uh, so I'm always mining everything for those moments of truth and what don't ring true. Um, mm -hmm. And when I got on the show, of course, we had our one little adopted son, and then her ex came back, and then she cheated on me and I like, know listen don't get me started <laughs> put a on that show they just don't shy away from it so yeah. there have been many a script I read I'm like oh my god just read I mean, every episode I'm, I'm like what let me have some tissue handy they're putting us through it and yes it's, um and it's and it's uh, I mean, it's an honor to me that they think I can do it yeah they give me stuff that I'm like oh she want me to lose lose my child okay great cool you know mm -hmm. Are you providing therapy sessions for those after the, you know, whatever? Yeah. It's, uh, mm. I also know so many women who have gone through this. Um, mm. And I have to honor them as well, straight or gay women. Yeah. Who've gone through the, the pain of wanting a child and they're not working out because you waited too long or, or, or whatever. You yeah. Know, I'm of the same age. You know what I mean? I don't have children and for a myriad of reasons, but you know what I mean? So it just really goes right to like the gut, you know? Yeah. To the gut, but that's what Ryan Murphy does. He goes right to the yeah, gut. he does. I was like, oh, mm. it's so it's so so great. But then you know, Aisha and I just <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Like we're just going through it, and like it's it's so bad. They say cut, and we just laugh. We're just like laughing and crying. Like what are we even doing with our lives? We're doing yeah. this purpose over and over again. <laughs> but you guys have such great chemistry, and I love the the image of these two strong black women on the show raising a family you know, including their son and, and conversation and making choices without giving spoilers, you know, but just, you know, it's just having those conversations and the mom and just the love, the black love that I see and just two strong black women running a household. You don't get to see that on TV. And that's why I'm like, I cannot miss an episode. Right. And the story is not about them being gay or about them. Exactly. That's what I love. I love. Yeah. And that's what I always try. One of my first interviews I ever did for the show I did called As If. Mm -hmm. So I think on my IMDb page, I'm like, I just want to tell stories about people who mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. I don't necessarily want to tell like stories that happen to people because they're black all the time. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. black people going through the things, but um, I don't want it to, I don't want it. Uh, we have so many black trauma movies, right? I mean, I yeah, we were, I was just talking to my friends about this. It's like, I need, we need a balance because there's so much going on. I, I need to, I, need, oh, I was talking to Will when I interviewed him because he picked the 40 year old version as his cherry pick. And mm -hmm. I was like, yes, we need some laughter it, with the balance of all of this trauma. We absolutely do. I'm just in like regular life. I don't wake up in the morning like, how, what black thing can I do today? I'm like, yeah. I gotta brush my teeth. I gotta go get a shower. I gotta go figure out what's my schedule. I gotta, blah, I gotta feed my dog. I gotta, you know. Um, so yeah, I just think we need to just open our, broaden our stories. Yeah. Uh, I think it's time. I think we're getting there. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a lot of black stories, but right now, this is the black stories are black and black. It's like, <laughs> 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 black, 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 black. Yeah, exactly. The is driven by, because they're black. You know what I mean? Which yeah. Is fine, which is great. But I'm like, yeah. oh, we have like just a love story between two black people. I love it. The love story. Well, okay. So speaking of just a story that's not about black trauma in a sense, you know, talk to me about um, the um, truth be told with Octavia Butler. And so with Ron Cephas Jones, who we love, Ron Cephas is a good friend of, of ours. And I love him. I just want to. For people who haven't seen it yet or who'll watch this, you know, later and see this, um, this is a full circle moment as well because Mackay Pfeiffer was in Stick Fly with you, right? And now you guys are both right. on the same show, right? So talk to me about your experience with this show and and um, working with Mackay again. Well, it's just, okay, this show is so um, uh, I love you, it's Octavia Spencer. Octavia oh my gosh. 
You know why? Because I'm thinking I'm, I, I'm Tyree Spencer. Because I'm thinking Kindred. I'm thinking send me. Yes, you're right. Thank you for thank you for that. Oh, if she watches this girl, listen. I, I apologize, Tyree oh, Spencer. Oh, oh, do not show her this clip, Tracy. Do not show her this clip. But go ahead. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, it's amazing. So we have Octavia, me, and Hanifa Wood playing these sisters, and we can. Yeah. So we're in Ron Tv Jones, our father. But it takes place in a black biker bar. Like, I mean. <laughs> in Oakland, you know what I mean? And yeah. Yeah, before COVID, we were all gonna learn how to ride bikes and I was really excited about it, but then COVID said, nope. Um, wow. So yeah, so it's about the story about this woman and she, you know, Octave was married to a Michael Beach, who went to Juilliard, I've known for many, 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 many years. All my friends are on the show. Makai I love it. Oh, Merle Dandridge is on the show now. Um, oh yeah, because you replaced her in Rent. Yes, I did. I yes. Mean, I was on the show and I'm mean, like, all my homies are on this show. I love but, it. It was so compartmentalized because there's so many different stories going on that I don't get to play with a lot of them. Okay. You know? But mm -hmm. the days we go to set, it's usually me, Hanifa, Octavia, uh, Tammy Roman, and Ron Siva Jones. And I'm telling you, it is a party. Ah, oh, this party. should be a fight on the wall. <laughs> you know, it takes place in a bar, like I own a bar. You know what I mean? And it's also, those scenes are usually really fun. Yeah. Um, particularly in the pandemic when you couldn't see anybody. It was like, I feel like I was at the club. I don't <laughs> Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it's really it's, it's, and that tells really really complicated stories about uh, about people who happen to be black. Um, yeah, and it comes up, of course, because like I'm like this black activist on the show, so it does come up. But but it's such it's such different storytelling. Yeah, so then you have like Kate Hudson on the on the season last year, like Aaron Paul and Elizabeth Perkins were on it. So we have this big high megawatt talent on the show, which essentially the and it comes down to it's a little black family. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um so it's just great. And every time they put me and Makai in the scene, I'm like, oh, they messed up. <laughs> <laughs> they messed up today and put us on here today. And <laughs> they're trying to keep us apart. Then nobody put me and Andre Royal in the same scene because me and Andre Royal ready to cut up. And I they, love it. They wrote a scene for us and then they cut it. We're like, oh, y'all knew. Wow. Yeah, cutting up on that day. But no, so, that sounds like a good set to go to. Like you can't wait to get to work and you get to see your friends and you get to play yeah. and and it's like work is fun and you know and it's a lot of joy going on. It's I love that. Fun, interesting um, and complicated, which is what I love. You know, uh, Michelle Tramble Spellman is our showrunner, and of course her husband Malcolm Spellman just yeah. let go do about, uh, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Yes, which I love. That's that series right. is so great. You have this couple who is killing it. Yeah, you know. Um, super black, but also super like complicated and then um, interesting within the interpersonal dynamics of the characters was what you want. Nice, I love this. Okay, so listen, we have I have two more questions for you, and then so and, okay, and I, I want to ask you. Let's talk about natural hair because you are one of the first actresses, like you know, out there with their and always natural hair. All the shows I've seen you in, all the things you've done on stage, even, and you know, that's the that's the the conversation in Hollywood here and in New York mm -hmm. about black women not being able to find people who can do their hair. And we're still talking about this today. You've been rocking your, like it reminds me of Lisa Gay Hamilton who was rocking her natural hair in the practice. So before these conversations were prevalent like they are now, talk to me, what was the, what was your secret? Because you was rocking your natural hair on these TV shows. I, I just didn't waver. I just, yeah very clear about what I wanted to do. And I thought it was very, very important at the time. And I feel like, you know, it probably cost me yeah. back in the early part of my career because people wouldn't, couldn't really see me as a or, or, you know, like that, like love interesty or whatever, mm -hmm. if I had my straight weave or whatever, they may have been different. Um, but I just took it. I took it because I just realized that it was an important conversation to push. And, mm -hmm. and when people would say like, well, we need her to be sophisticated. So you need me to straighten my hair to be sophisticated, why? Wow, yeah. They answer questions. So they just didn't want that smoke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me do it. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, but it was it was difficult because at the time there were only two of us. It's so funny you said Lisa Gay Hamilton. I played her wife on the show the first. Oh wow, wow, okay. For Hulu a couple years ago. The first it was really cool with Sean Penn. But anyway. Um so yeah, it I just I, I, it makes me so happy that it's not rare anymore. Yeah. Um, and between that and Chris Rock's movie, because Chris Rock and I oh yeah, I remember that yeah on a benefit, and he was like, "Will you come and talk to me about your hair in this movie?" And I'm like, "Yeah." Um, and I was like the only natural girl in that movie, and I didn't realize it. I, I didn't know I was going to be the only one. I'd have gone way harder to paint if I knew I was the only one. Yeah, yeah. 
but he was like, we're going to change this because it's ridiculous. This, this need for black women to burn themselves to, to be beautiful. Yeah. I think that car, that movie, you know, really was a huge, started a huge movement mm -hmm, mm -hmm. against the need to straighten your hair and the creamy crack as he calls it. You know what I mean? And, and, and you know, everybody does whatever they want to do. The, the, the thing that's wonderful about our hair is that we can change it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I went through two, I had two years where I was like, let me try what happened, see what happens to straight hair. I just, I tried it. I, I had straight hair and sent me. Yeah. Yeah. It just it didn't feel like myself. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't feel like me. Um, but it was interesting, you know, and, and you know, falsettos, I had a wig that like a Felicia Rashad looking. Yeah. Like, <laughs> character for sure. But if it doesn't require it, I'm like, it doesn't require it. Then why are you making me do it? Yeah. I can have different natural styles that will be lush and gorgeous and curly and whatever, you know? Wow. Well, thank you because I feel like you help usher that in because there was, I'm <laughs> telling you, you were one, the, when even when I look at old shows that you were in, like you were just rocking it. And I was just like, wow, there's no denying that you were part of that conversation ushering it in because not many black women at the time were rocking their natural hair when you were. Yeah, and they didn't know what their options were. Like, yeah, we didn't have all those options, and 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 you know, um, you know, April Yvette Thompson. Yes, you had to go to Cam and Kinks, so I went to Cam and Kinks and yeah. and got this baby curl twist thing that I rocked for many, many, many years. And and my uh, stylist Jamila Collier is her name, Jamila mm -hmm. Collier. Um, she's still in, in in New York. Um, she's like Blackberry something on. I'll find her. Instagram. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, I need her number. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, she's great. She like she pretty much uh she developed my style and we saw what happened if I grew it out. People on the street would stop me, not realizing that I was me. Mm -hmm. They're like, you look at the girl in cold case, you have that same hair. I'm like, because I'm the girl in cold case. So I kept sending her people and wow. I, stop me. She had my picture in her pocket. <laughs> she's like, This is you see this hair? I do that hair. <laughs> I, I did this hair, and I was like, she said, or oh, she freaked out because she came up to me to show me the picture of myself until she got in front of me and she realized it was me. She's like, I've been carrying around your picture trying to find somebody to do your hair. I'm like, well, you can ask me. <laughs> um, now there's a couple people out here. Um, my uh, my friend Ashley Nicole, um, she is kind of killing me. She did my locks. They look good. They're beautiful. They're by Ash Nicole on Instagram out here in LA. And she's killing all the natural styles. So once you realize you have all these options, to still keep your hair and a natural texture. There's some, I don't care about enhancement, adding more hair, take it. I don't care. We put makeup on, we wear bras, we wear Spanx, we do all kinds of things. Yes. And we're in a, a, a world of illusion and enhancement and, and things like that. So I don't care about that. White girl has been putting extensions in their hair. I mean, forever. Times in the beginning of time. Um, but what they don't do is change their hair texture to that of a race that oppresses them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, and if they, they try to get black hair, it's like they're appropriating hair that they've, uh, that they've punished us for having, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So I think now that people have options, there's so much celebration of natural hair. There's so many examples of natural hair on TV. I think now we can do whatever we, or you can straighten it or you can, yeah, we can do whatever we want. Yeah, exactly. Or, no, I agree. Or whatever. But I was really, it was really important to me to provide uh, an alternative. Nice. Well, listen, um, before the last thing is, I'm going to ask you about your cherry pick. We're, we're at the end of the interview. And so before we go, I like to ask all of my guests about a cherry pick. And I have this little intro that Bajor is going to play. And then on the other side, we're going to talk about your cherry pick. So talk to me about your cherry pick and why you chose it today. Well, you know, I mentioned earlier, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mentioned earlier that I grew up in a community theater um, in, in Baltimore. It's called the Arena Players, and now the Youth Theater Arena Players. Um, and the Arena Players is the oldest consecutively run Black community theater in the country. Nice. Um, and I grew up in, in this space that just really uh, celebrated uh, Black talent and Black kids and served the Black community. 
um, and broad arts and um, and culture to a community that people don't consider would necessarily have one in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was with them for many, many years, you know, and they've struggled over the years with like, you know, finances and things like that. So if anybody wants to support them, that would be just a great thing. And that, and that's where, you know, I came, I grew up there. Those are my stomping grounds. And I'm, I love the arena play. I love everything I stand for. That's so great. Now that's, that's a good cherry pick. And, um, <laughs> It's like a it's, no, it's a good, it's a good because I like the reason why I love the cherry pick is because I love learning about just there's so many things out there that I don't know about and just to learn, I mean, about the arena players because I heard I've heard the name like in conversation, but I just didn't know that much about them. And so when I went in and started looking, I was like, this is everyone should know about this and know the history behind it. And yes, support it. So the um, website is down there at the bottom. Please go check out arena's players. Um, you know, we're in this pandemic. They're trying to open like everybody else, send the money, you do, just support the arts, support black theater, I should say. Yeah. And so, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, this is it. We're at the end, girl. Oh, my God. This is such a good interview. It was such a good conversation, I should say. It didn't even feel like an interview. I know. A good conversation. And I talk fast, I know, but I I'm long winded. So I love it. No, you can, you drop some, you got some good gems and I, I learned a lot and just, yeah, it's just, it's very inspirational and I'm glad out of your busy schedule that you said yes. Cause I know, I know. And I really appreciate you taking the time. And so with that said, I'm going to, everybody who's watching or who will watch this later, let's all say goodbye to Tracy. Bye guys. Thanks it's for so good me. to have you. Yay. My mom, I know my mom is happy. <laughs> my mom is very happy. So guys, listen, um, that was such a good interview conversation with my girl Tracy and just very inspirational. A lot of beautiful gems in there. Um, that's it, pretty much it. I just wanted to say to you, thank you like every Sunday for watching, same time, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Instagram, um, Twitter, YouTube. You can find me, Facebook. And um, next week is going to be our last episode for a couple of weeks. You guys know how I like to take a little time off. So next week will be the last show for, you know, I'm going to give us like, you know, I like to give Bijorn and I like three to four weeks off so we can just do other things and rest. And then I can come up with a list of new guests. So that's what I'm doing. So next week, my last guest for this segment is going to be, drum roll, Nico Anand. If you guys have watched P Valley, you will see him next week. So please tune in. And that's it. Guys, thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>